Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. I am Amanda Harmoning and I am an admin assistant here at AERA. I will be moderating today's event and joining me from AERA is Rob Monroe. Hey everybody, yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development at AERA. And uh, we've got a treat for you today. We've got a really good webinar set up on assembly lubes and breaking oils. Both Amanda and I, we're gonna be in the background. We're gonna help answer any questions you may have throughout the webinar. Also, we're gonna leave some time at the end of the webinar. Um, so Lake will be able to answer any questions you may have at the end. And Amanda's gonna to explain to you how to use that control panel. So that's in the upper right part of your screen. So please feel free to ask any questions you've got and put them in those control panel. And what we'll do is I'll go back to Amanda and she will show you how to use that control panel. So back to you, Amanda. All right, thanks, Rob. First off, there's a couple different ways to listen in today. You can either use your telephone or you can listen in with the mic and speakers. Either way, make sure you select that radial button up in the corner and follow the instructions below. This just makes sure there's no background noise and everybody's on mute during the presentation. A um, couple other things. There is that little orangish box up in the corner. This is the grab tab. Collapse and expand your control panel during the presentation. This gets it out of the way so you can have a full screen to view everything. And then lastly, you'll see there's a questions box at the bottom. This is where if you have any questions or comments for us, enter those throughout the presentation. And we will be doing a Q&A at the end with Lake. So any questions that come up in there, we will do our best to get answered for you. So I will hand things back over to Rob and we will get going. All right, super. So just a couple housekeeping slides before we get on with today's presentation. Uh, we are going to be out in Texas uh, near the end of the month. So the 27th through 30th, we'll be out at the heavy duty aftermarket week. And if you're going to be at that show, uh, make sure to drop by booth number 1935. Both Dave and Brian will be there. Uh, they got some pretty cool things to show you that we've got on the go for 2020. So again, if you're out in Texas, make sure you stop by at the show there and say hi to those guys. Uh, for those of you that receive our Engine Professional magazine, it is going to be in the mailbox here for you pretty quick. And this is our first quarter edition for 2020. So it's jam-packed with all kinds of good application-driven articles. And our goal, of course, with this magazine is after you've read the magazine, is that you can apply a lot of this information right back into the shop or business right away. So if you can't wait for the one to, uh, to come in your mailbox, you can read it online. It is available here now. So if you simply go to www.engineprofessional.com, you can read our first quarter of EP. So it is available there for you. If anybody's on the webinar today and you're not getting Engine Professional Magazine, just let us know in that questions box. Uh, Amanda can then send you a copy and we'll get you on our mailing list to us uh, so you can start receiving that. So again, use that questions box and uh, we'll get you EP Magazine coming your way. All right, now who doesn't like free stuff? Um, we've got our next drawing, which is for our members who join or renew between January 1st and March 31st. You've got a chance to win this HP Pavilion 360 2-in-1 touchscreen laptop. So for those of you who remember, uh, we had our fourth quarter giveaway, which we had some really nice goods and tooling that we gave away. And for this quarter, we've got the laptop. So this applies to any new members that we get for each quarter. It also applies, or it applies to members who renew in that quarter, along with our monthly pay members whose anniversary is in that quarter. So everybody that is in that category is all eligible. And then we draw the name and uh, we'll draw it here March 31st and we'll ship this laptop to you prepaid right to your door. So pretty cool prize, uh, good thing to take advantage of there. If you're looking to purchase anything from our AERA store, uh, we've got things like manuals or books, we've got shop supplies, We've also got apparel, so if you weren't very happy with what you got for Christmas, then we've got things like fleeces and shirts and hoodies. And right now we're offering 25% off of our fleece jackets, hoodies, and t-shirts. So you can simply use coupon code FLEECE25OFF and you'll go to www.aera.org backslash store and you'll be able to then see uh, what we've got there in the store. So take advantage of that and uh, grab yourself a couple new hoodies or a fleece and, and do that. So, all right, so now let's get on with today's webinar, Assembly Lubes and Break-In Oils, and it's by Lakespeed Jr. of Total Seal Piston Rings. 
Now, Lake is a new vice president of sales and marketing over at Total Seal, and we're pretty spoiled. He's really well known in our industry, and it's always a treat to have him come join us. So I'll, uh, I'll pass things over to Lake. And so, Lake, how's it going today? Doing very well, Rob. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this. You betcha. I, I was getting a notification on my screen that I'd never seen before, so I was like, that was very weird. So I can go <laughs> ahead and get going here. So, all right, a little, sure. so sorry for the technical glitch. I've This is a fairly new computer for me, and I've not seen. Okay, hold on. Show my screen. All right, there, there we go. Now there you we're go. With gas. Okay, fantastic. Okay, again, thanks for everybody for tuning in today. Really appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about this. Obviously, people that know me know that I'm pretty passionate about oil and engines, and um, today's topic is very near and dear to my heart, uh, especially I was telling Rob uh, and Amanda when we were getting ready, you know, the last eight years um, where I was you know, spent most of that time at, at Driven, we worked very closely with uh, Total Seal. So me making the transition from Driven to Total Seal uh, back in December isn't too shocking if you knew how closely I had worked with Total Seal, specifically on braking oils and assembly lubes and what impact that has on break-in, you know, specifically on ring seal. And so this was something that was a big time point of uh, development and testing. So what today's seminar is really going to do is kind of go give you back that history, essentially roll back in time and go through the things we did and give you a little bit of insight on, okay, how, what, what did we see? What did we learn over the years of trying different formulas and doing different things, you know, some good, some bad uh, over the day, over the years of, you know, how to get the best ring seal possible, not just get by with something that breaks in, but how to get the best possible per performance. So you get the most efficiency, the best oil control, the best uh, oil life, all those things. So with that being said, let's go ahead and hop right into it. Um, for you, those who don't know, I am Lake Speed Jr. I'm a certified uh, lubrication specialist through the Society of Tribologists and Lubrication Engineers, uh, certified oil monitoring analyst. Less than uh, 300 people in the whole world actually have both uh, certifications. And also, my dad was uh, Lake Speed, the NASCAR driver, actually still is uh, alive and still racing. That's actually him in the blue helmet behind me there. Uh, don't worry, I'll show you in a moment. Dad's still faster than me. Um, especially on a go-kart um, and I spent you know 15 years at Driven Racing Oil and uh, the last half of that or so I was the head of R&D and development and did all the testing, uh, built the engines, did the dyno testing and all that stuff myself so pretty hands-on in, in, in that regard. So uh, like I said how's dad so this goes back a couple of summers ago uh, but as you can see, even in the 135cc Sidewinders, Dad with the 35, 6, 30, 30 was still a couple of tenths faster than me. And, you know, even last summer we went to another race and he's still right there. He let me win one race. He says he didn't, but I know he did. Um, but anyway, so Dad's doing good. Actually, just had shoulder surgery uh, right before, right after Christmas, actually. So he's kind of down for for now, but hopefully he will we'll get healed back up and we'll go uh, back to the track, get some more racing uh, done this summer. And who knows, maybe after that shoulder surgery, I might finally be able to get him. You know, he's 71 years old, so he'll be 72 tomorrow. So maybe that's going to be the right number. I was born in 1972. He's going to be 72. Maybe the numbers align. We'll have to see. So anyway, uh, back to the, <laughs> the point of the seminar or the webinar today. So, you know, metalworking fluids and people, you know, from something like tap magic to, you know, honing oil, you know, metalworking fluids are something that machine shops and machinists use when you're cutting metal. And the whole idea is to try to get the correct surface finish, dimensions, and extend tool life. And like that. So metalworking fluids are really important uh, part of machining in terms of trying to get that correct surface finish so you can get parts to fit correctly. And if you think about that, that's kind of what break-in is. If you think about, you know, a good example is, you know, a flat tap at cam, right? The, the lifter and the cam have to mate together. And for those two to mate, there has to be wear. Now, there's a spectrum here. You know, if you go way old school and say, we well, just put in the cheapest oil you can with the least amount of protection and just barely run it in to wear it in and then stop, 
to try to get it out, you know, to try to wear that part in. And that's one way of doing it. Of course, there, there's a lot of risk that, you know, there's not a lot of <laughs> latitude there. If you, if you go too far, or, you know, the loads aren't are too high or the parts are maybe a little bit off, well, it could be catastrophic pretty easy to do that. The flip side is you put in something that has almost nowhere at all, well, then the parts really don't mate in properly and it may take a long time for them to mate properly and they may not ever mate properly. And that can be a real problem with piston rings and we'll cover that more in later. But the idea is that break-in oil is essentially a metalworking fluid the last metalworking fluid, if you think about it, um, that you're putting in the engine to allow the final mating, the final machining of those surfaces so they match up correctly. And if you take nothing else away from today's webinar, that's the correct way of looking at assembly lubes and braking oil. Is what you're looking at as trying to finish off all the work you've done up to this point so that the parts mate together properly so that it has a long functioning life and does its job you know and the kind of good way of thinking about that is you know break in oil you know they say for cam break in back to you know putting on assembly lube on the cam, on the cam break in oil you know the whole zdp thing that pretty much everybody in the industry has been through that's probably the best example you can think of about that is that you need to have you know, braking oil that has the ZDP to get the job done once the engine's running, but you also had to have an assembly lube that was going to provide anti-scuff properties and stuff while you're assembling the engine, turning it over, setting the valves, right? When you're, when you're setting everything, you're going to need something to protect it. That's why, you know, like grease and then braking oil, that combination of things was designed to help prevent scuffing, scoring, galling, welding, during that initial startup, initial break-in, you know, so that you didn't have too much metal removed. You're trying to make sure you're not, it's not too much, not too little. You're gonna hear that over and over again today. Again, the other takeaway uh, from today is when you think about chemicals, about assembly lubes and breaking oils and anything else chemically really, is remember the old Goldilocks and the three bears, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just right. And that's a good rule of thumb to apply to chemicals is that you don't want too much, you don't want too little, you want it just right. And that balance is the key when it comes to all of this. More isn't always better. And we've seen over the last 15 years, I've seen all kinds of crazy things when it came to oil. Uh, so especially during break-in, you know, so if one bottle of additive is good, two bottles, three bottles is not better. <laughs> you know, I can tell you that already, you know, so just kind of, you know, keep that in mind as we as we get into into, into more details. Um, when we're talking about lubrication, it's really important to understand that there's actually three different types of lubrication, three different you know um, films, if you will, inside the engine. So we, we're talking about is this thing called the Strybeck curve, and that's the boundary, the mixed, and the hydrodynamic. Um, uh, forms of lubrication. So hydrodynamic is the name implies over there in the far right hand side of the page is full film lubrication where the two parts moving in opposition of each other are separated completely based on the viscosity and oil film. Just like water skiing, you know, the boat's going fast and the skier's up on plane, you know, that it's you're riding on that film, right? That's exactly what you're trying to do in engine bearings. So when your engine bearings are running, that's what's happening. You're running in that oil film. Okay. We'll flip to the other side to the boundary condition. That's your valve train, you know, because you're thinking about it. The camshaft runs at 50% of crankshaft speed. So it's running a lot slower and there's static pressure from the valve spring. So, and that lower speed, higher load. Now you get into much thinner films. We got metal on metal contact. If you look right there in the middle of the screen, there's that Zn divided by P. So that's the the calculation, the formula, if you will, for the Strybeck curve, and that's viscosity times speed divided by load. So that's how lubrication can be looked at, is and how you calculate to determine where you are uh, either in boundary or mix or hydrodynamic is viscosity times speed divided by load. We go back to our water skiing analogy, you know, the full film hydrodynamic, 
Well, think about it. You know, a water skier, the boat's going, and you've got the water ski that's supporting the load. You know, so that's yeah. The, as the boat accelerates, you know, to pull the skier out of the water. Well, when the skier's in the water and the boat's not moving, the skier's in the water. You know, he's not on top of the water. He's in the water. That's like your boundary condition because you've got all the load but no speed. But then as the boat accelerates, as that as the speed comes up, now you start to build that oil film. Right, you build that film and the skier comes up on the surface. So kind of think about lubrication the same way. So your boundary condition, your valve train is that high load, low speed, metal on metal contact. That's where the additive package in the oil makes all the difference. Then you've got that mixed film where basically as it's kind of like the skier coming out of the water is in that transition stage. That's where you, the additives and the base oils both play a role. And then that high speed full film, that's where the base oil does all the work. Now, the interesting thing about piston rings, and which is why I love you know, the new job at Total Seal, is that they operate in all three conditions. So every cycle of a four cycle engine, piston rings see hydrodynamic at mid stroke, which is the fastest the, the piston's going. But then as it piston nears top dead center on a compression stroke, right, it begins to slow down. And then right about top dead center, it comes to a stop, right? And at that point, you have the highest pressure because you've, you're, you know, if you say you've got 20 feet, 25 degrees of advance on timing, well, you've already started the flame propagation, right? You Sparks already been lit. Flame fronts beginning to move, cylinder pressure is increasing. So you got increasing cylinder pressure as you have get decrease in piston speed. That's where you get into those thin films at the near top dead center, which is why you have more wear at the top of the cylinder bore and less in the middle, right? Beca because of those transitions. So as we go through all of this today, just understand that these are the things that are happening in the engine and the different stages of lubrication and why different things have a different impact on the final result. So surface finish, again, the idea is you can take a piece of a metal and you can cut it dry. And there's a couple of things that are gonna happen is typically surface finish won't be as good. Sorry, that's my dog in the background. There we go. I work from home now. Um, so surface finish, if you take that dry piece of metal and you cut it dry, typically, you're gonna get a little bit rougher surface finish. The idea of coolants and oils is designed to make better surface finish. And the idea of a smoother surface is more load carrying ability and better sealing. And that's gonna be really important when we get to piston rings here in just a few minutes. So the idea of measuring surface finish, you have to use a device like the Zeiss Profilometer. This is one that a Billy Godbold has at Comp Cams that I used a lot to do valve train wear testing. And the idea of that is that profil that device, the stylus moves across the surface and it actually measures and characterizes the roughness of that surface down to micron level. So very, very small. So here's an example of a flat tappet camshaft. Uh, the one on the left is brand new. The one on the right is one after break-in. What you can see is, especially that say the middle uh, slide, there's, there's top, bottom, or top, middle and bottom there. If you look at the bot or the middle left one, you can kind of see that surface roughness across the entire width of the cam lobe. So that's basically top uh, max lift on a cam. Now you look at the one immediately to the right of that, and you can see how that roughness, those, those peaks and valleys, that, that jagged line gets a little bit smoother right there in the center. Well, that's the contact area where the lifter sits. And of course you can see that it kind of caves, or it kind of is a little bit concave right there. And of course that's the reason because a flat tappet lifter is actually convex, right? It's got a little bit of crown to it. So you can see the crown of the lifter wearing in to that surface and that surface getting smoother. Well, that smoother surface gives more surface area to support the load. And there's still some valley in there to hold the oil to lubricate the surface, that lubricate the interface between the cam and the lifter. And that's really important. You have to have enough valley to hold oil to provide lubrication between the two contacting surfaces. Again, more on that later. But I think that kind of gives you a good visual example we're talking about in terms of breaking in. You're smoothing that surface to create the, the mating, 
but also provide you know adequate lubrication going forward you know here's an example of okay different chemistries will yield different results so again two different cams uh, the same design same lift same duration same runtime same lifter design ZDPA versus ZDPB, and you can see a difference in the change of the of the wear pattern between the two. So not all oils are the same, not all chemistries are the same, and that's important as you go forward. You start making the decisions about what oil am I going to use, is to understand these subtle differences. That just because it says it's high zinc, well, what does that really mean? All right, there's different types of zinc, so you need to be, un understand what impact those are going to have. Okay, so what does this have to do with ring seal and break-in? Well, a lot, and hopefully you kind of get an idea of that already, is that what you're trying to do is achieve this plateau, right? If you go back here, just a couple of slides, right, that one on the right in the middle, you can kind of see that same kind of plateau finish right there in the middle where that cam broke in perfectly. That's a kind of a perfect break-in right there on the right-hand side, that middle slide. You can pair that pattern to the one right here, and you can see that it is smooth on top, which can bear the load, but it's rough underneath, and that rough underneath is what holds the oil. Back to cross hatch on a cylinder bore, and that's what we're looking at here, is that, you know, that piston ring is riding on the cylinder wall, and that cylinder wall has to be the bearing, no different than the bearing for the crankshaft has got to, you know, support the load, have the oil there to build that oil film, same thing, that cylinder wall has to have enough roughness in it to be able to hold the oil, to lubricate it, and to help seal the piston ring to the cylinder wall. Now, of course, we won't get into all the different things today because this is essentially, you know, surface roughness, honing. That's another seminar. That's a book by itself. So we're going to hit some high points here, but that's about it. We're not going to get too deep into it. We'll save that for maybe another late, another webinar later this year or next year or something like that, where we really do a deep dive into honing and to crosshatch angle and surface finish and what your RPK and RVK value is really going to be. But the key thing to keep in mind right now is that RA, you know, roughness average, is really a number that's not very useful because as you can see on top, there's an RA, and you've got the plateau to the top side and the peaks to the bottom, right? That's a good load-bearing surface on top with valley to hold oil. But you flip it over, RA in the other direction is a whole bunch of peaks sticking up. Well, that one on the bottom is going to be terrible for wear. It'll be terrible for break-in, and it's going to cause all kinds of abrasives. So RA doesn't tell you enough. What you really need to be looking at are these three values. RPK, which stands for reduced peak height. So that's how much is sticking up above the core roughness. And then the RK is just that. It's the core roughness. And that's going to be the part that carries the majority of the load, right? So you want a, a good RK value. That way you've, you've got a good load carrying area, not too much peak above it, a good strong RK, but you still need to have some RVK, which is your valley depth. That's your oil retention, right? That's the part that's going to be there to hold oil. I think back to the days in NASCAR when we we're trying um, the mirror bore finishes. You, know, you get these uh, cylinders and you would bore them and you hone them all out and you get them, like, they were mirror finished. The problem was when we did that, there wasn't enough valley to hold enough oil. And with the very low viscosity oils we were running back then, like 5W20 and 0W20, it was pretty easy to actually burnish the rings and blow by was, in, was a problem because we just didn't have enough oil at the top of the cylinder in order to lubricate the ring when it needed it during that high pressure. You know, as it decreased speed and increased load, it needed the oil to help protect in that boundary condition, and we just wasn't enough there. You know, proper lubrication can always be described as having the right oil at the right place, the right time, and the right amount. So just remember those kind of things as you move forward and making these decisions that, you know, part of that having the right oil at the right place, the right time, and the right amount really does relate when it comes to piston rings and cylinder walls to these values, your RPK, RVK, and RK values are really important and when it comes to making sure you have enough oil at that right place at that right time and enough of it. 
So here's just kind of an example, uh, just kind of a generic example that we provide of, you know, as you go through that honing process, when you start off, you know, with a 220 silicon carbide plus then going to a 400 silicon carbide and then hitting it with four uh, strokes with a brush to clean it up, this is an example of what you can do and you, you can kind of you know, hold your head sideways, you know, you start off in your RPK value, your peak height starts off at 66, then drops to 22, and then finishes off at 10. Your RVK value starts at 100, drops to 65, and then finishes at 40. And then your RK value, you're starting off at 191, it's going down to 58 and then it's ending at 35. And this is, you know, we say is a pretty decent looking cylinder finish that would get the job done. It's, if you want to call it textbook, you can, but you know, it, overall what you need to have is enough valley to hold the oil and enough um, plateau area to support the load. And it's back and forth. And this is just an example. It's not the only way, and it's just not saying this is for, what's right for every engine always, but it's just kind of a give you a, uh, an idea. If you've not had a profilometer, you've not used a profilometer and before, this is the kind of information that a profilometer can provide for you, which is why we think it's very important to use a profilometer to understand, to have these numbers so that you know what it can be, because this is all in micro inches and you cannot see that with your eye. So it's important to have the, the right tools to be able to get you the data to make decisions based on that data. And the reason for that is piston ring seal really comes down to, you know, there's a few different leak paths. And the important thing is we kind of all know about the ring gap, right? And it being a leak path. And of course there's different things like, you know, obviously Joe Moriarty years ago developed the total seal piston ring or the gapless ring, you know, to be able to uh, try to minimize some of that gap. And, you know, per me personally, I I've never actually used a, a gapless ring. Um, at Gibbs, we didn't use the gapless rings. We used the diamond finish rings, and that really is not. Say, I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place uh, for the gapless ring. They definitely have a place um, at certain times and applications. But other applications, this the gapless ring isn't the best path. There's other technologies that uh, you can we can uh, deploy from Total Seal's perspective and other rings perspective in order to give you the protection and, and the performance that you're looking for. So obviously, leak path number one is the ring gap. Leak path number two is actually around the ring groove. And as you see there, the flatness of the ring itself and the surface finish on the ring itself have a direct impact on how well it seals. And then the oil itself is actually the sealing medium. Just like, you know, you got a cylinder head and a block. Well, if you put the two of them together, you wouldn't expect it to seal very well. You put a gasket in between. The oil is the gasket, essentially, in this scenario. Same thing with the leak path, which is between the face of the wall and the ring, right? So the face of the ring and the cylinder wall, that is also another leak path. And just like you, again, cylinder block and cylinder head, or uh, engine block and cylinder head, if you try to bolt the two of them together with nothing in between, it's not going to seal very well. You need a gasket. The oil acts as that gasket in both leak path number two and leak path number three. So flatness and then, you know, conformability to the bore, those are really key things. And the oil is playing a role in both of those. So question, we've heard this for years uh, and we probably pretty much all know that, hey, we, it's been said for years and years, don't use synthetic for break-in. And there's a good reason for not doing it. Not to say technically you could develop a synthetic oil and use it for break-in. Uh, there are teams that are using synthetic oil to break in. There's, you know, things like that. But what happened in those cases is one, if you have perfect cylinder finish, which is what some people, you know, say Formula One level teams can achieve, then there really isn't any break-in on the ring. If the ring is already pre-lapped and the surface finish on the wall is perfect, then there's very little break-in to happen or no break-in to occur. Then you can put in a synthetic oil right away and you're fine. But the reason why for the majority of all of us in the real world, you know, outside of F1, 
why we have to use, we want to stay away from synthetic oil is because of that little starburst, that little symbol on the synthetic bottle. So synthetic oils are typically premium products that meet the fuel economy. They contain friction modifiers to offer more fuel economy. So when you put in friction modifiers that provide fuel economy, that reduction in friction has a negative impact on ring seal, ring break-in. Essentially, back to that uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, we need to have somewhere, but not too much wear. You know, if you have basically nowhere, then you're not going to be able to get the rings to bed in properly. So low friction, not good for needing that controlled amount of break-in. So that's the main reason to stay away from synthetic. It's not because synthetic oil, synthetic base oil by itself couldn't get the job done. Technically it could, but practically when you're, the oils that you buy off the shelf that are synthetic have other additives in them that make them less than desirable for ring break-in. So that's why as a, in general, stay away from synthetic oil for break-in. Other thing goes to the detergent level. Old school guys would always say, use straight 30 non-detergent oil for break-in. Well, it had nothing to do with being straight 30, but it had a whole lot to do with being non-detergent. Because as we all know, ZDP, zinc, is essential for break-in, especially for flat tap at cams, but detergents actually fight against the ZDP. So while the zinc is trying to build the film to allow the parts to mate in, right? If you think about it, back to that gasket analogy, if the ZDP is building a film, it's like building that gasket so that the parts seal together better. So a high zinc level is a good thing, but detergents don't discriminate between zinc and sludge or varnish. They just tend to clean things off. So in the old days when there was some zinc in the oil, but no detergent, the zinc was free to do its job, and then that would actually allow for a better break-in. So you want a lower level of the detergent. It can be like non-detergent or very low detergent. That typically what works best, and it's just, again, going back to the old days, why did that work? That's why it worked. And there's also another thing, too, about detergents that we'll talk on a little bit. And if you happen to have been on the webinar we did, I think it was about a year ago, on low-speed pre-ignition, uh, if you remember, and we'll talk about it more today, that detergents also have an impact on the detonation tendency in direct injection engines, you know, which is a high compression engine. So something else to kind of keep in mind as we go ahead and go forward, make your decision about what oil to use for break-in is that a lower detergent oil in general is also safer, especially for a direct injection engine in terms of, you know, minimizing the chance for knock or detonation that could occur during break-in, which could be devastating to the build. So, okay, back to the TBN level, which is a byproduct of detergency. So, if you look at the, the fuels or the, the examples here, you got a methanol fueled engine there on the left, and you got the exhaust port uh, with a higher TBN oil versus a lower TBN oil. TBN is total base number, and typically the higher the level of detergent, the higher the TBN of the oil, right? So what we're seeing here is much more soot, uh, you know, darker, more oil in the exhaust port with a higher TBN oil than a low TBN oil, and that's on methanol. Then you flip to the one on the right-hand side of the page, and that's a gasoline-fueled engine, and you can see the oil in the exhaust port, and that's from a very high TBN oil, much like a diesel oil. So a lot of diesel oils are gonna run around anywhere eight, nine, 10, uh, 11 on TBN, so 9.9, call that 10. So here's a TBN of 10, and you're seeing oil in the exhaust port, Whereas the TBN of 1.2, basically non-detergent, you completely clean. Now that's from the exact same engine, the exact same port. Both, uh, and that, both examples are a 0.7 millimeter diamond finish ring, which is a Thai nitride co face coated ring. So that's a very hard face coating, harder than chrome. So that's a pretty hard ring to break in especially in a 
a wet sump motor where there's no vacuum to try to assist that process. So is it, is it a very extreme example? Yes, it is. But, you know, one of the things is when you go to that 0.7 millimeter ring, well, that ring versus an 043 ring is worth literally 20 horsepower. I'm not even kidding. From a 043 ring to a 0.7 millimeter ring and that engine, it was worth 20 horsepower average. To gain that advantage, you couldn't just put Rotella or some kind of, you know, diesel oil in that engine to break in that ring to get it to seat properly. To take advantage of the of the ability that the thinner, harder face coated ring can offer, you had to match it with the chemistry to get the job done. So again, both of these examples kind of tie back to that old school straight 30 non-detergent. Again, not straight 30 that makes it work, it's the non-detergent. And you can see that that example that that lower detergent level is enabling a higher level of break-in performance in a shorter amount of time, which is critical for the performance and longevity of the engine, especially in a direct injection engine. So again, just a real su quick summary. If you happen to have watched the webinar last year about low-speed pre-ignition, it's an abnormal combustion event uh, that is typical at low engine speeds, high loads in direct injection engines, and it's a detonation event that can be catastrophic to the, to the engine. And the detergent level of the oil has been found to be a critical uh, you know, function or, or contributor to this uh, situation. Some testing that occurred at Driven along with Ben Strader and the guys at EFI University with, a direct in, with an LT1 uh, GM direct injection engine. We uh, tried some mixtures of both calcium and sodium with their both detergents and saw that there was engine knock with those. Even a, a high level of calcium above 2,500 parts per million, even with some molly, which helps reduce LSPI, we still saw knock events. But the key thing is when you drop the calcium down, the detergent calcium to 1,500 parts per million, there was no knock. So that lower level of calcium detergent and uh, emitting sodium completely was beneficial in terms of knock. So I only bring this up is because when you're bedding in the rings until it's completely bedded in, you're gonna have some oil consumption. You're gonna have some oil migration into the combustion chamber as we saw from the previous slides. When that happens, you wanna make sure if, you, if, if possible, that you're utilizing oil that doesn't have anything in it like sodium that can cause abnormal combustion. You know, you want to limit that so you're basically minimizing the overall risk of the engine having a problem, especially during the critical running in and bedding in time. So what additives matter? Uh, the higher the level of calcium, the higher the level of sodium, the higher the tendency of LSPI. Magnesium is also a type of detergent, but fortunately it has no impact on the, the knock tendency of the engine. So you can use more calcium or more magnesium and not have any concern. Now, increased level of ZDP, increased level of molly decreases LSPI, which is good. Now, the, the down, so ZDP, which you know is that's good. We don't need to have that for the phytopic cams. It's beneficial for uh, LSPI protection. So that's overall a good thing to have in your braking oil. Molly, not the best for rings. You know, back to that friction reduction. Molly is a friction reducer, so you'd rather not have a lot of molly uh, in your oil if you can help it, because uh, that's going to be something that kind of works against that wear process. You know, so you want to have it again. Back to the three bears, you want to strike that balance. Uh, here's another example from our testing we did at Joe Gibbs Racing, again with some total seal rings measuring blow by so we look at the blow by numbers and the horsepower with a high tbn oil during break-in so the, the peak blow by or the, the average blow by actually was uh 12 or, or 21.2 and the horsepower at that time with that level of blow by was 668.2 that's an average over the operating range of that engine uh, which that's a uh, a cup engine and then the next one when you went to the low TBN oil, the blow by dropped from 21.2 uh, to 18.9. And then the horsepower went up from 668 to 671.7. So you had a little bit of change and in increase in power, decrease in blow by just by changing the TBN 
value of the oil during break-in, which they were both using the same viscosity oil. So the only variance there was the TBN of the oil, both mineral-based, um, both uh, same viscosity. So the only thing you're seeing there is really the relationship between those two. Again, we've said it over and over and over again today, Goldilocks and the three bears. You, the chemical rule of thumb with all of this is not too much, not too little. You want it just right. So that balance is the key. The next couple of slides we're going to go through are the results of the different brands of oil that we've had analyzed by Speed Diagnostics. If you want to look at this report in detail, because it's probably going to be fairly hard to see on the screen, you can go to www.speeddiagnostics.com forward slash total seal. And on that page, you can download the report that we're about to go through. I'll keep that up there just for a minute if you want to write it down. All right, let's move on. So we're just kind of roll through uh, all of these. And, and again, we're not picking and choosing brands. We're not saying any of these brands are bad. We, we're not making any call about anything other than we're going to basically say, here's the results. And again, we've already talked about it. You typically want to see a lower level of calcium. You want a higher level of ZDP or at least a moderate level of ZDP. And you don't want friction modifiers and you don't want synthetic, you know, in general terms. So you've got all these different brands through here. And what you're seeing in the report is it's going to give you brand by brand. So the sample ID numbers is basically the, the lab bottle that it went in the date the sample was taken, the brand of oil, and all of these, unless it's otherwise noted, are break-in oils. So when it's saying maxima, it's not it's the maxima break-in oil. It's not taking maxima race oil or motorcycle oil. Anything you see here, it's that company's break-in oil. What they say is break-in oil. We're not taking something else and utilizing it and something like that. We're not trying to play any games here at all. Again, we, we think there's a lot of great companies here, a lot of great oils, and people have had good experiences with a bunch of these different products, and, and that's fine, and that's good. But we want to do is give you that extra bit of information that you can't find on the label to make sure that if you're going from, say, an 043 ring to a 0.7 diamond, diamond finish ring, that the lubricant you're choosing to use is also appropriate for making that change in your ring package in order to take advantage of what that ring package could offer. So what you're gonna see is the brand, the viscosity grade. Now, a lot of different brands have multiple viscosity grades. We didn't test every single viscosity that they offer. We're making the assumption, and of course that can get you in trouble, we're making the assumption that all the viscosity grades of their breaking oil have the same chemical profile, that the only change is the viscosity. So if they've got a 1550 and a 5W30, you know, they're the same additive package in both. It's just the viscosity is different. And so with that being said, we just kind of go through that. Then what you're going to see on the report is you're going to see the viscosity at 100 degrees C. That's your actual flow measurement of the oil. And you'll be able to see the different viscosity grades. You're going to see a change in that viscosity at 100 degrees C number in relationship to that, right? So for example, so the maximum 10W30, it's a 10. And then the Motul 10W40 is a 15. Okay, well, 15 Cenestokes is pretty typical of a 10W40 motor oil, whereas the, the uh, 10 Cenestokes is pretty typical of a 10W30. So you'll see these trends line up across the way, and then you're going to see the oxidation value, which is basically an idea of what the oil life is. Uh, the, these low numbers, something below like you know 15, is pretty typically going to be just a mineral-based oil. There's nothing synthetic in it. When you get up over 30, that's something that kind of indicates there might be synthetic products in there. And you'll see some of these around like maybe 23 or 27. Well, what I'm guessing is happening here, because I don't formulate them, I don't know, I'm guessing is that the viscosity index improver they use is a, a type of ester. So it's a synthetically created multi-grade additive. It's not a synthetic base oil, it's the multi-grade additive has some synthetic characteristics to it, which is why it's driving that uh, value up. Typically, it's a, they call it a PAMA. Um, that type of viscosity index improver has some, they call it ester linkages in it, and that might be the reason why you're, you're seeing that versus an Olaf and copolymer style, which you would not see that. Again, that's just my guess based on looking at it, because I don't 
know these formulas and we didn't call the guys and ask them to tell us what they use for viscosity modifier you know because it just didn't didn't do that so then the next part you're going to see is the tbn if you already discussed that that's your your value typically we want to see a tbn of five or less is what typically works best so five or less on tbns which you're kind of going for then the silicon that's going to be your anti-foam additive then you're going to get into the additive package itself. Again, calcium, sodium, magnesium are detergents based on the LSPI information. You would like to see less than 1,500 parts per million calcium and no sodium for the best LSPI protection in a high compression engine, especially a direct injection engine. Then you got your phosphorus and your zinc, which is your ZDP. And then you got uh, molybdenum and boron. Boron may or may not be a friction modifier. It can be a dispersant in some cases. So it's, it's really not fair to say that any boron in there is a friction modifier and is going to be bad. But molly typically is something you don't want uh, in there. So you, if you had a preference, you, you could stay away from molly then try to stay away from Molly if you can. So that's basically how to read that report. And of course, you got this page right here. That of, of, Those are 10 different uh, oils on that page. The next page, you've got 10 other ones. Now, we have included on here uh, products like Rotella, which even though it's not a breaking oil, <laughs> if people use it for breaking oil, though. So we, we added it to there. Same thing with the pa uh, Valvoline. Uh, VR1 is also on the next page because it's something that people do use for break-in. Whether they should or not, you know, that's a different question. I don't think you should. I don't think Valvoline VR1 is a break-in oil. The regular Pro-V, you know, not, not a bad break-in oil, but the VR1 is not ideal. Uh, although, if you look at it, the calcium levels down. The sodium is now gone. So it's not the, the, and this is the new formulation of Valvoline VR1 that's been out for about a year. Not too bad. It's got a little bit of molly in there, but overall, you know, it's, that's not, not too bad. TBN's a little bit higher than you'd like to see, but you know, it's not the worst thing. You know, here's the problem we talked about earlier. You know, the old days, it was all about using non-detergent oil and it worked really good. Well, today's non-detergent oil, and I'm not picking on shell. This is just some, some oil we bought off the shelf and had it tested, well, there's nothing in it at all. There's no additives, period. So that's not a good oil, right? So when the old days where non-detergent oil had some additives in it, today's non-detergent oil has nothing. So that's a problem, you know? So you can't just go all the way back to the old days and figure that out. So, you know, with that being said, you know, hopefully we've been able to kind of cover some things today and, and kind of, you know, highlight the fact that ring seal really requires a lot of factors coming together. You know, the surface finish of the rings themselves, the flatness of the rings, the flatness of the ring groove, the surface of the ring groove, the uh, cylinder wall finish, that all of that comes together along with the oil in that running in process and the break-in oil, the whole goal of that is to smooth those surfaces to get better sealing. You know, and if you don't want too much removed because then you're going to scar the surface, you don't want too little removed because you don't get enough sealing. So the perfect seal really comes from having all those surface finishes come together. And the idea of a break-in oil is it gives you a wider operating range. The wider the operating range, the better it can do in terms of being able to allow those surfaces to come together, whatever imperfections there are in the process, it gives you margin of error. And that's the real key thing that we're trying to get across here. And then there's some formulations that kind of give you maybe more margin of error than others just due to their chemistry. So hopefully that's been, been a help in covering that. Uh, I want to give a little plug while I can, if, if people don't mind. Uh, we've launched a, a new podcast called Hidden Horsepower. And uh, it says it's supposed to be available tomorrow, but it's actually we turned it on the day. So anyone listening to this podcast right now and you're done, if you want to go listen to Ben Strader uh, from EFI University, talk about Project Spinal Tap and what he learned in that process of, you know, taking that LS engine, LS7 and spinning it to or saying it's spinning it past 11,000 RPM, you know, intentionally not missing a shift, right, that 
that whole process is going to be available. You can listen to that uh, interview with him and Joe Costello and Keith Jones on Hidden Horsepower, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, uh, Google Play, SoundCloud. There's a lot of different platforms. We've got tons of episodes coming out. I think this is a great resource. If you love engines and you're into horsepower, uh, check out the Hidden Horsepower um, podcast. And I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it. And with that, I think I left us just enough time to answer some questions. Oh, super, Lake. Uh, that was a great presentation. It's, uh, it's always nice. I mean, technology is changing so fast. It's nice to have you help us learn, you know, about topics that we need to know about. So uh, I do have some questions here. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll get rolling with those. If we do run out of time, uh, we know everybody's time is, uh, is crucial. So what we'll do is we'll carry on with some questions. If we start to carry on a bit too long, uh, just keep the questions coming and then we'll forward those to Lake and in the next several days, he'll, he's really good at getting back to us. So we'll, we'll get you those questions and stuff. So, all right. So let's start with uh, the first question we got, Lake. Um, do you have different recommendations if installing a new cam and lifters compared to new lifters and used cam? Well, I mean, obviously, if you have a used cam with new lifters, the lifter itself still has to break in. So you would want to basically do the exact same thing, even with new, even with a, with a cam that's technically already broken in. Um, that's not the ideal scenario, obviously. If, you, if you, Ideally, you would like to have new cam and new lifters because each of them are going to try to establish their own, I mean, their, find their own center. You know, so there's, there's obviously some issues potentially trying to put new lifters on a used cam, uh, depending upon how much life is left in the cam and where the wear pattern is and how that goes together. Uh, but you still want the same type of protection from the assembly lube and braking oil, and I would go the same direction in terms of chemistry-wise for both of those, because they still have to mate up. Okay, all right. Here's another one for you. Uh, this gentleman's asked, Corvettes, I believe Volvo, and I know Triumph motorcycles come factory filled with synthetics. What do manufacturers do to control break-in? Does the factory fill meet the requirements, low detergents with the possibility the customer does not change the oil at, as recommended? Okay, so what's happening in a lot of factories where they are coming with synthetic oil, um, a good example is General Motors that uh, people are probably familiar with uh, GM's Dexos oil spec. They came out with probably 10 years ago or so. Uh, so there's a Dexos 1 and there's a Dexos 2. So Dexos 1 is what you buy off the shelf at the parts store. Dexos 2 is what they actually install in the vehicle in the factory. So that oil is a bit different. It doesn't contain friction modifiers. It might be synthetic, but it's going to contain either no friction modifiers or a lot less friction modifiers in order to basically make it more appropriate for the application. And then the other thing, too, is you got to remember, say, uh, a car that's built, say, or say, a better example, a Chevy truck that's built in um, a factory. Well, that engine, that L L LT engine, is actually built in Tonawanda, New York. It's not built in the car factory. At the end of that assembly line, they run that engine. You know, I, I know from doing some work we did with Cummins uh, that, you know, Cummins would actually break in. They had braking oil, and they ran in every engine they built at the end of the production line for seven minutes. And then they shipped it to the uh, vehicle manufacturer where it's installed. So just because the vehicle manufacturer ships the vehicle with synthetic oil in it actually doesn't mean that's the only oil or the first oil that's ever run in the engine. And then like I mentioned too, you know, if you say, if you look at say General Motors, another good example, when they're honing in the factory, they're also using a completely different setup. You know, they're, they've, they're honing with, you know, you know, say a V8 engine, they're honing all four uh, holes at the same time. And they're doing it with coolant and they're using different materials to do that. So there's a little bit different um, process there where, again, surface finish, they're able to control slightly better because of the equipment they're using. And then they're also, you don't really see all the pieces and that the oils are slightly different from the factory. It's not the same stuff you buy off the shelf. So those are the two reasons why you see that from some manufacturers having synthetic oil from the factory and it works for them. It's not the same thing as you honing it with a CK10. 
no offense to CK10 owners or to Sunnen, if you hunt with a CK10 and you go buy some synthetic wool from the park store, you're not going to get the same result that they get because it's not doing the exact same things. All right. So this one is in regards to uh, the, the one thing that you covered there about the compression ring. So why does a thinner compression ring make such a big difference in horsepower? Conformability, right? So we're sealing. So really, you, you got a couple of things you got to look at. Um, the number one source of friction in the engine is the cylinder wall to piston ring interface. So if you can go smaller on the height of the ring, a couple things happen. One, you have less surface area. If you think about, you know, how much drag there back to water skiing, if you've got a really wide ski, there's a lot of drag because of the size of the ski versus the narrow ski, you can go faster. So from a friction perspective, just straight drag, a smaller ring has less drag. So it's got inherently less friction. Number two, that smaller ring is more conformable to both the ring land, because the thing about it, that piston, you know, when, when combustion happens, that piston is being flexed. If you look at a finite elemental analysis, you know, FEA on a piston, it's not static, it's moving. So the thinner ring conforms better, moves with the contour and the change of the piston. So it's a better seal because it's more conformable. Same thing around the circumference of the ring. It can move to the bore because we all know, you know that cylinder bores really aren't 100% round and 100% straight top to bottom. That's why you have a pat gate or <laughs> most of us don't have pat gauges, they're too expensive. But if you've ever seen a trace from a pat gauge, it's not a perfect cylinder. It looks like a slinky dink, you know, um, moving through there. And that's so this the thinner ring is able to conform better to all those variations in the bore top to bottom. So better ceiling, less drag. That's why there's such a big power gain by going to a smaller ring. All right. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that are somewhat similar. Um, people are wondering about some of your um, slides that you had about uh, the, like the break in oil comparisons and that kind of stuff. Is any of this information going to be available afterwards? Um, like if let's say we had their email addresses or would you, is this something that's uh, uh, proprietary or is this something that you can share? If we're, uh, so if you're talking about these slides right here that I'm showing, yep. All of those are available right here at that URL, www.speeddiagnostics.com forward slash total seal. All of that information is available right there. You can go download it right now. Okay, and I'll make note of that too. So if we got any more questions like that, I'll, I can help forward that link to people after the fact uh, through email. So we'll make sure we do that for you because that's really good information. Uh, another question here is, how do you know when to move from braking oil to normal running oil? Uh, how do you know if the rings have finished seeding in? Okay, so if you're dynoing the engine, uh, you can pretty much know that uh, once the engine kind of plateaus and levels off in terms of power gain. You know, if you've got a blow-by meter, uh, you're, you've got a vacuum uh, gauge on the engine, depending on what kind of engine you're building, once that kind of goes flatline and, and is you can make it three or four or more power pulls and it's just steady right there, you pretty much know you're there and you can move on for, at that point if you want to. Ideally, what I would like to see and my experience says kind of works best is you want at least one hour of engine runtime on the braking oil. The, it's going to be somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes is when the braking oil will have done its job. You know, you have to have load in order to get the rings to seat. If we go back, you know, to the, the stride bet curve, you know, back here in the beginning, one thing you, you see all the time, uh, we're gonna be doing a video about this really soon, is that people will baby an engine, right? They're afraid that they're gonna hurt the engine if they run the engine hard. That's completely the worst thing to do for the engine, especially for the rings. You know, you have to have cylinder pressure to create the load, and that's what's going to drive the, the ring into the cylinder wall that's going to activate the ZDP, because ZDP is heat and load activated. So you need that to be able to get the ring to 
the, to break in properly. So if you can run the engine for 60 to 90 minutes on the dyno or on the street and you you get the oil up to operating temperature and you're running the engine at full load and you're letting it accelerate and you're letting it decelerate, you're doing all those things, don't be afraid. If the engine's right, it's going to be good and the oil is going to do its job and be that gasket, if you will, and, and protect the engine. Then it's going to be good. I bet a lot of that baby it, be careful and get it out quickly came from the old days when people ran non-detergent oils and some of them probably weren't very good and they were just they tried to to, to run it in to kind of wear it real quick and then get it out and they were being careful because they, they, they the oil wasn't good enough to do the job well these breaking oils like all the oils you saw there other than the non-detergent oil they all had a pretty robust additive package you should be able to lay on that engine as hard as you want to and it should be fine the oil is capable of meeting the challenge. So don't baby the engine, run it hard in order to build the cylinder pressure to get the rings to seat. Again, 60 to 90 minutes of runtime, get it out and then go to regular oil. All right, so here's one more for you. Uh, here's another one. Well, we'll keep going to the questions. If everybody's got the time, uh, if Lake, if you've got a few more minutes, we've got some yeah, questions, got so sure, I okay. All, all right, so from a tribology perspective, is there an ideal clearance for bearings or like piston to wall clearance? Well, it really depends on viscosity, right? So viscosity and clearance go hand in hand. You know, that was the thing that got everybody in trouble when low viscosity oils came around is that, you know, that old school rule of thumb, you know, a thousandth uh, clearance per inch of journal diameter plus a half. If it's a race motor, well, you know, and a lot of engines that would end you up around 3000 bearing clearance. Well, 3,000 bearing clearance, you know, pretty much needs a 40 to 50 grade oil. Well, when people came out with, you know, 5W30s and they throw that 5W30 in an engine that's clearance for 5, you know, 2050, and it spun the, the main bearings and rod bearings, well, it's not too surprising because you didn't have enough viscosity because of the wide clearance. So same thing, if you go pretty tight piston to wall clearance, which – is really beneficial in terms of keeping the piston from having rock over. You're going to have to run a little bit thinner oil to make sure that you can get enough oil up in between the piston skirt and the wall in order to properly lubricate, you know, the rings and the cylinder walls. So, you know, there, again, back to the Goldilocks and the three bears, and I know I'm not giving you a hard and fast number, um, but if you kind of look at the same chart, I know Driven has got a chart on their website in the catalog that's a oil viscosity to bearing clearance chart. And that would work for any brand oil. So it's not specific just to Driven. It's just something that I know because I wrote it and it's there. Um, that basically gives you an idea of bearing clearance to viscosity. You can take that same logic and apply it to a piston to wall clearance. You know, now one difference in piston to wall clearance is you got to be careful about skirt growth, right? The uh, growth of the piston. So where with a you know oil, you know, and a bearing, you can basically start tightening it up, tighten it up, go lower and lower in viscosity, and things are going to go pretty good for you. You know, you can run pretty tight clearance, you know, like they do from the factory, and run zero twenty, and you're fine. The trick is you can't go that tight on piston to wall because the piston's going to grow. So you and you've got to understand if it's a forging or a cast piston or a billet piston and how it's going to grow and you got to compensate for that. So the piston to wall clearance is something where again, if the tighter you go, you do need to be a little bit thinner to make sure there's oil, but you can't 100% follow the same kind of rules you would on a bearing uh, because of piston grows and bearings typically don't. All right. So this gentleman, I says, hi Lake, great job on this one. I have a question regarding heavy-duty diesel engine break-in. Can we use the BR40 or GP1? Yeah, you can. Uh, BR40 would be just fine. The GP1 break-in will be fine. It's a low detergent oil. Uh, you know, for a diesel, you can definitely break in uh, with a break-in oil. You don't have to run a, a diesel engine oil for initial break-in. I mean, you saw on there that, you know, John Deere even had um, – 
a break in oil. Now it's kind of weird because they had all kinds of molly and stuff in there, which is kind of weird. Um, but you also remember too, though, a lot of diesels uh, also end up, you know, big tractors like that. The engine oil also can circulate through other things and you know, so tractor hydraulic fluid sometimes. So, um, but yeah, you can certainly use BR40 for breaking in a diesel. It'll probably help it come in a little bit faster. You know, again, you look at the John Deere breaking oil, that 7.52 on the TBN is actually quite a bit lower than um, a typical diesel oil. So even within their spectrum for breaking in an engine, the D John Deere product, you know, it's a little bit lower TBN than a typical uh, diesel oil. And it's got a fair amount of magnesium and magnesium, again, is a detergent. One difference between magnesium and calcium is magnesium tends to form rougher, higher friction films compared to uh, calcium. So the fact that this oil's got some moly and some boron in there, but it's got a fair amount of magnesium, that magnesium might be overcoming the moly and that combination just has proven to work for them. You know, again, it's, it's not that there's only one way to skin the cat. These are general rules, general things we've seen that work most of the time, but like that John Deere is a pretty good exception to that rule. And it shows you that, you know, you, you got to keep an open mind and use what works. All right, so we got time. We're going to do one more lake, and then what we'll do, like I say, any of the other questions, we'll pass along to you, and uh, and then we'll get back to everybody. Um, where did it go here? So I know you touched base on this just a little bit, but this is a pretty common question that we get, uh, especially from the shops on the tech line. How many miles after engine break-in do you then go to synthetic oil? I like to see 500. 500 is kind of my, my go-to, you know. I, I like to see 500 miles on breaking oil, and then from that point, you know, carry on. You know, I I, I think that's been, I mean, that's worked. You know, over 15 years of doing this, uh, that's kind of been my go-to, and that has uh, seemed to work in the majority of applications. And tell the customer okay. not to baby it. Don't don't go 35 miles an hour. You know, if you if you've got a 600 horsepower engine, don't don't be afraid to go out there and you know do some. I shouldn't say do street racing because you shouldn't street race. That's illegal, and I shouldn't say that. Uh, but you know, when you're accelerating on to the on ramp to blend in the traffic, don't be afraid to use the horsepower that's there to help blend in, so the car, car you know you're merging in front of doesn't hit hit the brakes. That's actually not only a bad thing for slowing, you know, helping helping traffic not to build up, but it's also helping your ring to break in and your engine to break in properly. You know, past 500 miles, what you're worried about is you know there's 10 times more wear in the first. 10 hours of an engine's life than the next 100 hours of its life. So you want to get all of that material out of the engine as soon as possible. So by the time you get to 500 miles, which you get 57 miles an hour, that's about you know 10 hours of runtime, essentially. At that point, you want to get that oil out because it's dirty. That's the best thing you can do is get it out. And then put fresh oil in there and carry on. At that point, you want to put synthetic in, go right ahead. All right, well, we're, we'll wrap things up. Um, Lake, like I say, we do have some more questions here for you and I apologize we couldn't get to everybody, um, but I'll get those over to Lake here in the next several days. And Lake, we do really appreciate your time. Uh, we know you support the industry and you're always there for us to, uh, to help answer questions and that kind of stuff. So again, thank you for your time. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, it's such a topic that, like I say, I mean, it, everybody uh, in the shops, I mean, things are changing day to day. So it's nice to have you on board and help us out with that. So what I'll do is uh, thanks again, Lake. We appreciate it. And I'm going to go back over to Amanda and she'll just wrap things up for us. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thanks again, Link. Um, there will be a survey when you get out of the webinar today. Please take a moment, fill that out. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know if you have any additional questions for Lake and we will get those over to them. Also, you will get an email tomorrow that will contain the link to today's webinar and that is yours to use as you would like. You can pass it along to other people in your shop, watch it again at your convenience, whatever you would like to do. And lastly, you'll see the AERA contact information there. We got our phone and email addresses. You can also reply to any of the constant 
contact emails or go to webinar emails and those come directly to me and I will make sure to get your questions answered. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great rest of your day.